Welcome everybody to Marsh Watch number five. I am excited to be here and excited to talk about these species today because one of them uh, holds a special place in my heart and we'll get to that guy in a bit. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying I am broadcasting today here from Saskatoon, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, encompassing the traditional homelands of the Cree, Dakota, Nakota, Soto, and Stony First Nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis. And it's also a pretty beautiful place. My name is Leanne Latchmoy, if you're tuning in for the first time, and I work for an organization called Birds Canada. We've got a mission to drive action to increase understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. And hopefully we're hitting on a bunch of those points here today. Um, we're also a not-for-profit. Not um, we've got offices Canada-wide, and I'm located in Saskatoon, and I've been in Saskatoon since 2015. And time's flying already. On the agenda for today, we've got some birds and amphibians, but I've also included some invasive wetland plant species because somebody sent me a nice little fact sheet about how to tell apart the um, invasive versus the native Phragmites. So we'll go over that. And I thought I'd include a couple of other invasive wetland species so that if you find them, you can report them, which is part of the challenge, you know, knowing where these things are. So this will all be recorded and posted online afterwards, and we'll shut the recording off and we'll have the the quizzes and discussion portion of the evening. So without further ado, we're gonna be having some waterfowl species, a couple more dabbling ducks. We'll get into some herons and bitterns. We got great blue heron, American bittern and least bittern. And of course the Wilson's phalarope, which is an interesting little bird here, um, as well as two toads. We've got the Canadian and American toad. Let's start off with the gadwall. The gadwall is probably one of those underrated ducks. Um, I think it's a quite a handsome duck, but it's definitely more along the plain end of things. It's a large dabbling duck, so it's going to be you know close in size-ish to a mallard and have a relatively steep forehead. It's going to have a nice sort of slender bill and those are the kind of things that you'll get better at once you start looking at a lot of ducks and start getting familiar with how they're shaped. Um, the drakes, I think, are quite handsome. They're kind of grayish overall. If you see them close up, you'll notice there's all kinds of variegation in the feathers along the, along the side and along the breast, but especially at a distance, you know, that all just kind of turns gray. So they look very cool, very gray overall. And the thing that you're gonna to use to identify, especially the drakes of the gadwall here, is this entirely black rump area. The tail is the tail itself is brown, but all the feathers above and below the tail, all on this rump area, are jet black. And it's kind of the, the opposite of what I've been telling you most of the time that say, you know, pay attention to where the white is on the duck. There is not a heck of a lot of white to look at on this duck, but at a distance, that jet black rear end on this kind of otherwise plain looking duck, that sticks out like a sore thumb. So take a look at a distance. You're going to have that nice dark rear end. They've actually got quite a nice little, um, you know, wing pattern when they're in flight. Um, on the upper wing here, there's a nice little chestnut patch, and then there's kind of this bold black and white speculum pattern. Quite handsome little fellas. Um, you'll find them in all kinds of shallow water. Again, this is a dabbling species, and, you know, wetlands with any open water, you're likely to find a gadwall in them. The hens, on the other hand, they're probably one of the more plain, um, harder to, to pin down um, hens of the dabbling species that we have. So she's going to have a steep forehead again, kind of that that finer bill, and we'll compare her to some to some mallards um, in a little bit here, but you know, slender bill, and it's going to be, you know, edged in orange and have a darkish center, and you'll see that all over on, on the hens. It's going to have the dark kind of long center and then edged in orange. Oftentimes she's got a little bit of that white speculum patch hanging out along the side, but otherwise she's really quite plain. There is a dark eye line going on there. So this is probably going to be one of the trickier hens to identify. Overall, not very, not very distinctive. So it's going to take a bit of practice. And you know, if there's a brown duck that you can't figure out, that's not the end of the world. Not everybody, you can't identify all the brown ducks that are out there in the world. So that's what the female gadwall hen looks like. 
these guys are mostly vegetarians. They'll eat submerged aquatic vegetation, seeds, but then they'll also go after, you know, invertebrates, um, including in insects and crustaceans. And for the hens, this is pre predominantly during the egg laying stage when they need a lot of calories to keep, you know, producing those eggs and laying a full clutch. And they make, I think it must be my favorite duck sound. Um, if you've ever watched Sesame Street, it sounds a lot like the yip yips. And so they go, uh, this is the drakes that do it. Um, the, the hens all kind of make general quacking noises in in the dabblers, but the drakes are the ones that are going to be doing the more distinctive sounds. So this is the bet, 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 bet call of the drake. <laughs> And they'll do this a fair bit in flight too. So sometimes you'll be standing there and you'll hear this bet 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 beps coming at you from behind. And I I generally can't help but laugh. And it really to me does remind me of the yip yips from Sesame Street. So if you know what those are, hopefully that can work as a little memory clue for you for the Gadwall, but a hilarious sound. So want to compare our largish dabbling hens that have orange on the bill. You've got the mallard, the northern shoveler, and our gadwall that we've added today. So the bill of the mallard hen is going to have, you know, dark in the center. It's not going to be along the whole length of the bill. Usually it's going to be in the form of a dark saddle. Sometimes that saddle can be kind of splotchy and not quite as thick and dark, but overall she's going to have a nice orange bill with that kind of dark splotch in the middle. The northern shoveler hen, hopefully you're going to get some practice with this and you'll see her. She's got, got this great big shoehorn on her face, so it's large, it's spatulate, it's orange with kind of olive tones on it. And hopefully that's going to be distinct enough to you when you see it that there's not going to be any mistaking it with, with another species. It's really an oversized, massive bill on that duck's face. The gadwall, on the other hand, you know, it is it is a smaller, more delicate, finer bill with that dark center all along the bill and then the edge um, in this nice orangey color. The speculum is going to be white for the gadwall, green bordered with white above for the northern shoveler, and that classic mallard, you know, blue bordered with black and white above and below for the mallard hen. So hopefully, you know, when you see a bunch of hens that you're, you're going to start to figure out, okay, looking at bill color, are they showing me any of their wing patches? You know, I'm going to be looking at the face. These ladies don't have a ton going on on the face. You'll notice the shoveler hen has a more plain face overall, but really for her, it's going to be that that honking big spatulate bill. And the gadwall, little, little fine bill edged in orange where the mallard hen is going to have that orange bill with a big splotchy dark center on it. So hopefully this will help uh, ease your, your dabbling hen looking at. Okay. We've got another dabbling duck. This is the American Widgeon. It's going to be a little bit smaller than the ones we've talked about so far. It's going to be kind of, they're going to be medium sized overall. They've got this handsome little bill. So it's small blue gray and it's edged all around in black, like around the, where it connects to the rest of the head. The tip is dipped in black and along the edge of the mouth, it's also going to be black. This can be sometimes darker in the hen. And overall, they're going to have a really steep forehead and when I try to explain, you know, the steepness of forehead, just imagine that you're on skis or a snowboard and you're at the very top of the duck's head. How terrifying is it going to be to go down that slope? The American Widgeon, it's going to be pretty scary, um, especially if you're like me, who's a baby beginner skier. I'm not going to go down this duck's head. So a rather steep forehead on the American Widgeon in profile there. And the drakes are, are interesting. They've got this kind of white to buffy cap and forehead, the extent of which differs between individuals. There are some like this inset picture here that really there isn't a whole lot of the white. It's overtaken by a lot of those speckles, um, you know, versus the ones on these other photos here. There's like quite a bold white uh, patch on their head. They've also got this greenish kind of eyeshadow stripe 
that goes, you know, from the eyes down the side of the head. And again, this can either be, you know, a little bit reduced in some of the drakes, or it can be quite, you know, bold and extensive. But either way, they're going to look like they're wearing some kind of eye shadow on. There's going to be, you know, a darker coloration down there. What really stands out on the American Widgeon, though, and the thing that, that catches my eye first when I look at them is they're they're kind of, they've got these beautiful pinkish sides to them. And it's really, you know, a, a beautiful creamy pinkish color. Their, their rumps are black and white, but that the thing that always catches my attention first is that color. And, you know, if so if you want to pay attention to that kind of creamy colored side, then that'll, you know, get you into Widgeon and then you can confirm with all of the rest of the, you know, little ID features. They're a pretty unique looking duck. There isn't going to be a whole lot that you might confuse them with. You might confuse the drake with um, the, the green winged teal drake, who's also got those dark eye lines that kind of green, but overall it's a fairly different looking bird. If you remember on the, the green winged teal, the drake's going to have a white spur on the side here, and you're not going to see anything like that on the American widgeon. The speculum is quite bold in the drakes. Um, it's kind of iridescent green, but this bold white wing patch is um, really stand out standoffish when it's um you know off in flight it's going to be reduced in the females but quite bold in the drakes speaking of the ladies let's take a look here she's also going to be kind of distinctive so she will also have that blue gray bill that's edged in black as i mentioned it can be sometimes a fair bit darker in the hens she's still going to have a nice steep forehead and instead of that you know big garish um green um eyeshadow, she's going to have a dark smudge around the eye. So it's just really going to be kind of a dark shadow around the eye. And that surprisingly stands out at quite a distance. You know, you've otherwise got this plain brownish head and this really dark smudge around the eye. She's also going to have a little bit of that, you know, warmer brown pinkish color on the sides. Definitely not as extensive as it is in the drakes, but you know, especially if you see the two side by side, you can sort of see the resemblance there and those warm tones along the side. Again, her speculum is going to be kind of reduced compared to the males as, as it is mostly, but, you know, greenish, blackish with a little bit of edging in white. But really that facial pattern, that, that dark smudge around the eye combined with that bill that's kind of blue-gray edged in black is going to really point you in the direction of American Widgeon Hen. These are also mostly vegetarian. They'll eat a lot of aquatic vegetation, but they'll also snack on upland grasses, clover, fruit, seeds, um, agricultural seeds and leaves, aquatic invertebrates. And again, this is mostly the hens when they're, they're in the egg laying phase. On the bottom here, you can see one of the drakes that's got more of that kind of buffy straw colored patch instead of the bright white, but that's still, you know, within the natural variation of the species. Um, I see I can write, I've got a uh, diet written where I should have habitat, but you'll find these guys in shallow wetlands with open water and areas with upland cover. So usually, you know, some, some native vegetation around that is where you're going to have more American widgeons than others. They're less common overall than other dabbling ducks. So for me, it's always a treat to see them. And they don't call too, too frequently, but they do make this really lovely kind of wheezy zoo, 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 zoo call that here. So as you can imagine, that's not the most loud and boisterous call so it doesn't travel a great distance so this probably factors into why you know you hear that less in the american widgeon in part because you're going to often be too far away to to get a good listen to it but that is the handsome little american widgeon we'll compare the females once we do um some of the the diving species because that gray bill um, is going to come up again in some of our divers okay Moving along to a different guild altogether, we've got the Great Blue Heron, and I suspect this is going to be a pretty familiar bird to most people. You know, it's kind of the iconic large heron that is standing, you know, kind of majestically on the edge of a pond, and they're definitely one of those, like, stock and weight 
predators where they'll just hang out at the edge of a wetland or the edge of a lake and just kind of stare intently down at the water and then all of a sudden they'll they'll have this burst of grabbing whatever um, they can grab and they do they grab all kinds of food so this is a very large heron this isn't uh isn't a small species by by any stretch of imagination they got a really massive large yellow and black bill it's very wedge shaped um it's kind of got that all-purpose dagger bill to it they're very long and slender necked but again you know as with a lot of posture in birds, they can they can change their posture a fair bit. So you can see in the the bottom um, center here, there's one that's kind of got its neck all scrunched up and it's kind of hunched over. And you know sometimes you wouldn't even think that might be the same bird, considering like oh it's it's such a long necked, lovely looking bird on you know in other postures. So just know that especially with herons, they do have a very long neck and they they can retract it like they do in flight. So you'll often see them in flight with this, you know, their neck kind of coiled up in an S shape. And that's going to be um, a distinguishing feature from something like a, a sandhill crane that is always going to fly with its neck stretched straight out. A great blue heron is always going to have its neck coiled in in flight. Both sexes generally look the same. They're kind of blue-gray overall in color. They've got a bold black stripe kind of that starts like above the eye and goes down um, along the back. The adult has a has a white crown and it's black or gray in young and immature birds. Their their throat and belly are kind of whitish with dark streaks. And depending on how the bird is holding its feathers or the angle that you're seeing it, you might not see those kind of black and white feathers. So evidently, for the most part, you're really just going to get this overall sense of this is a large kind of blue gray looking bird and. In the breeding season, at kind of high breeding season, they've got all of these lovely plumes on the head, back, and breast. And those are those, hey, look at me, you know, can't I grow the nicest plumes? Uh, don't you want to um, lay some eggs with me? So those are the really, really beautiful um, plumes on their backs here. And those don't last a terribly long time. They're kind of fragile and they, they, don't, they don't last terribly long. Again, this is a bird that's found um, often at water's edge in water bodies that have fish, but they nest colonially in trees. And sometimes these colonies can be quite a ways from water. Sometimes they're they're quite near water on the edge of a lake, but they can also be a little ways in tucked into trees. I've also seen them nest singly. So I've seen them in the Aspen Parkland where it's just a single great blue heron um, in a lone nest, away, well away from any other colony. So oftentimes colonial but it does happen where you get the odd individual or odd pair rather that you know is off on their own and they will travel you know quite a ways for you know hunting their their prey and their prey can include everything that will fit down its gullet so fish amphibians invertebrates reptiles mammals other birds really if it fits it will eat it um it's it's quite comical to watch them and sometimes quite shocking when you see them eat something like a small bunny um not everybody <laughs> really likes it when they see that but you know that's life and they they are a rather large predator so they're they're very very opportunistic and as i mentioned they're really that kind of ambush predator they they'll slowly walk and wade or they'll just hang out in one spot and just wait for something to come by and bam they're they're amazingly quick when they when they strike so they're generally fairly silent but they also make these kind of guttural croaks and squawks so here's a here's some great blue heron calls for you Not not the nicest sounding bird by any stretch of imagination. You know, considering how beautiful and majestic it looks, it's it's always surprising that you know the sounds don't always follow that. But they have these great big stick nests, and they're they look quite angry when they're when they're sitting in them. So that was our majestic great blue heron, handsome little bird. 
Related in the heron family is the American bittern. This is a large heron, not as large of the great as the great blue heron for sure, but they've got a you know compact body, relatively thick looking neck. And I say looking because you know most of these are gonna under all of those feathers, it's not gonna be very thick, but it looks thick based on you know the way the plumes sit. It's got relatively short legs. It doesn't have those incredibly long legs like we just saw on the great blue heron. So there you wouldn't be confusing this with a with a great great blue heron. Both sexes um, look similar. They're streaky brown overall, and they have lovely, nice, dark flight feathers. And they're hilarious because they're they're incredibly cryptic. You know, they don't like to be seen. They're not going to be like the great blue heron that's standing majestically on the edge of the pond. No, no. This is a cryptic bird who is cryptic in coloration and behavior. And I've seen them you know, walk and they will kind of do this jerky, slow back and forth movement as they as they move along to try to mimic slowly moving vegetation. And if you get close enough to spook them, they will stick their heads straight up and gently sway like a reed. But these these birds have incredibly mobile eyes. So when they when they're sticking their bills straight up, they can actually look straight at you by turning their eyes. I think I've got a, a photo on the next slide of that. It's just, it's absolutely hysterical to see. And because of all of this, they can be quite a tough bird to see. It took me years of doing marsh bird surveys and hearing them lots and, you know, flushing the odd one to actually see one on the ground. So, you know, if you find this is something like, oh, I would love to see this bird. I've heard it lots it might take some time. You'll just have to get lucky. Um, they do like large wetlands with plenty of emergent vegetation. They'll actually nest in some of the upland habitat. So having, you know, naturalized large wetland areas is, is important for this species. And they make one of the more incredible noises of the wetland. And it's one that you wouldn't necessarily think was a bird at first. So I'll just play it for you instead of trying to, to imitate it, but it's it's quite amazing. And they do this sound by by first gulping in some air. So at the beginning of this, if you're close enough, you can actually hear the bill snap as they're swallowing air for this call. I'll play that again. I think that's just the one call. So I've heard them called thunder pumpers, or especially here on the prairies, slough pumpers, because a lot of our small ponds and wetlands are referred to as sloughs out here. So it's just a really incredible sounding bird. Um, just, just one of the neatest things. It is the males that presumably make this call. Um, there's a little known about female vocalizations in American bittern. So they, they likely do make some calls, but what those are necessarily, we don't um, know. So this is thought to be just the males doing these calls. And much like the great blue heron, they're going to be tucking the, their, you know, long neck in when they're flying. So you can always tell those herons because they've got that, their head tucked way back in when they're in flight. Herons in general, kind of, especially the bitterns, they've got these kind of, relative to their size, kind of short roundish wings. You can see that, that the wings here aren't terribly long and pointed. If you're lucky, you might see one in flight, but if you're even luckier, you'll see one on the ground. Um, on the bottom left here, here's here's a photo of that kind of, you know, head sticking straight up, swaying back and forth, but eyes laser focused on you, um, trying to pretend to be a reed. In the breeding season, they can actually grow these really lovely plumes along their back and they'll fluff up these like black feathers and their, their little throat feathers. Um, I have yet to see any of these like decorative plumes out in all their glory. So that's still, you know, something I'm looking to see at some point. Much like the great blue heron, they're an ambush predator. They slow walk, they sway, or they'll stay in one spot and they'll, they'll consume whatever can fit. So for these guys, that's going to be mostly insects, amphibians, small fish, small mammals, and crayfish. So that is the American bittern. Now onto the least bittern. And for me, this is 
the least bitterness why, you know, I, I got started my career in birds and wetlands in particular. I was, you know, surveying wetlands um, as my first field job out in Southern Ontario around Long Point. So this is the bird for me that started it all. So I've always got a fondness for them. This is a small heron-like bird, and I think it weighs about a Mars bar. It, it is not a very large bird. It's it's quite small, and under all those feathers, there's not much to the bird. They have a compact body, short legs, and if you thought it was tough to see the American bittern, it's very, very difficult to see a least bittern. I've had good looks at, I think, just one in you know, two summers worth of surveying for nothing but least bitterns. I've seen a few fly, but they're they're often, you know, a bucket list bird for lots of people because they're they're adorable and they're tough to to come across. Um, males and females look similar, so both sexes have contrasting coloration patterns. Um, they've got these kind of warm orangey tones to the body with these kind of orange streaks down the throat and breast and belly. The males are gonna have dark blue on their upper back and cap. That's gonna be kind of a brownish chestnut color in the females. Um, She's also going to have a bit darker stripes on her breast, but overall they're they're kind of similar. So nice, great, big, long bill, um, especially for the body size. These guys too can extend their necks out, but generally they tend to keep them a little bit more hunched. Um, you'll find them in large wetlands with dense, dense emergent vegetation, especially cattails. They really, really, really love dense, impenetrable stands of cattails and they prefer those cattails to be in fairly deep water. So that's where you're gonna find them. Dense, expansive thickets of cattails where you can hardly get in there and deep water so that they can fish. And actually some of them, you know, um, make a little bit of a runway. So they'll purposefully fold down a little bit of the older vegetation to make a little bit of a feeding platform. They're very, very cute. Here's an example of a female here, similar looking to the male, but you can see instead of that kind of jet black blue looking color, she's got this more chestnut coloration going on, on, you know, the upper parts of her back. These guys will peck dense vegetation over deep water. They'll go after small fish, insects, amphibians, and small mammals. Much like all of the herons, if it can, if it fits, it they'll eat it. <laughs> um, and the males make this lovely... Um, soft cuckoo cooing sound and it, if you're familiar with um oh shoot name just came and went black-billed cuckoo it sounds similar to a black-billed cuckoo but not quite so here's the cuckoo cooing call of the male least bitter <laughs> So this is definitely one of those species where it is going to be worthwhile to learn the sound. They're very, very, very difficult to see, but they're much more easily heard. So I'll play that cuckoo cooing again. It kind of sounds, yeah, like, like some light cooing <laughs> coming from the wetland. <laughs> All right, so that was our least bittern. And for our last bird of the evening, we've got the Wilson's phalarope. This is a bird that tr that turns the stereotypical, you know, bird gender norms on its head, where the female is the brightly colored, aggressive, territorial one, and it's the males that actually incubate the eggs and take care of the little ones and is not very aggressive. So it's a rather small little shorebird. They've got this incredibly fine needle-like bill. It is just the most delicate delicate little thing that that you've seen it's it is quite incredible and needle like is really the way to describe it. it is very very fine and very very pointy a relatively small head females are the boldly color one as i mentioned so they're going to have this nice you know black that extends from the eye down along the sides of the head this little whitish cheek and throat patch here and this kind of faded salmon color as well as this lovely little gray cap um, and the back is covered in this kind of 
mottled chestnut and brown like uh, blue coloration so very very elegant little bird um the females are the ones that compete for baits and they're the aggressive ones they're the ones flying around doing all of the aggressive calling and flying and fighting and the boys take care of all the parental duties and again they're not they're not the ones um you know vying for mates or anything so it's a it is a reversal in the typical you know gender roles of birds if you will here's some example of the male here very very similar in looks to the female but just more subdued so not going to have that quite quite as um, extreme dark patch going down the side um, it's going to be lacking a little bit in the coloration on the back because this is going to be the parent that is going to be incubating and taking care of the young. So you're not going to see that kind of chestnut and blue pattern on the upper back. But overall, it's, you know, very, very similar to the female. Similarly, you know, fine needle-like bill. Um, and they're just, you know, a more subdued version of, of the female. You'll find these guys in habitats that have wetlands with some open water, and they've got really, you know, erratic flight patterns, and they fly very much, you know, like a butterfly does, it, you know, just kind of flying here and there in a really erratic flight pattern. They look incredibly buoyant when they flight. They're when they fly. They're really, really neat little birds. And um the, one of the cool things about them, if you get the chance to watch, especially a group of them do this, is that one of their, you know, favorite ways of feeding is actually floating out onto the water. So they'll go and, you know, float just like a duck does, and they will spin circles in the water. And what they're doing is they're, they're spinning, they're kicking their feet up, and this creates little upwellings of tiny little, you know, aquatic organisms. So small little aquatic insects, small crustaceans, little plant seeds and stuff they can stir up. So you'll see them spinning, you know, madly around in tiny tight circles, pecking at the water that, you know, they're upwelling. It's just absolutely hysterical to watch. So um, if you see phalaropes out on the water, they're they're pretty adorable. And it, it is neat that they do this little upwelling and they get all these tiny little critters. Um, it's It's something really cool to watch. The females in flight, as they're doing this kind of erratic flight pattern, they'll let out these kind of low, I, th I think that sounds like a woof, woof call, so I'll play that here. So a little woofing, a little barking, it sounds... Yeah, it, it's an interesting little sound. Um, and they'll get up and they'll get agitated if you get too close to, you know, maybe where their mate is or where where the nest might be. Um, you know, they'll they'll get up and they'll fly around you doing all of these little woofing calls. Um, I'm just, just seeing a comment in the chat. Is there a reason that female Wilson's phalarope are more like males and other bird species? I, I don't know if there's necessarily a reason behind it. That's just how they wound up doing it and that's the case in all of the phalarope species that i'm aware of at least you know the the three that we've got in north america so not sure that's just the just the way it happened with these guys okay now we've got a couple of toads first we've got the canadian toad and this has a more central distribution um it's medium size they can grow to about three inches um you know toads are a bit more adapted for life on slightly drier land. They don't have as moist a skin that's definitely drier than frogs do. And the thing to pay attention here, because we'll look at the American toad in a sec, they're very, very similar. And one of the best ways to tell them apart is by looking at the cranial crests. So on the top of the frog, or on top of the toad here, we've got these cranial crests. There's also these little um, kidney bean shaped glands. They're the parotid glands. Um, I'm not sure what they secrete. It's been a while since I've um, dug deep onto all of my amphibian physiology. So if you know, in the, in, type it in in the chat. Um, but so there are these little kidney bean, kidney bean shaped parotid glands, but there is cranial crests in between the eyes here. And in the Canadian toad, those cranial crests actually meet at the base. So they they actually touch and there's contact. So like most of the frogs that we've 
encountered before. The Canadian toad has variable body color, you know, it can be tan, brown, green, gray, and they've got a nice warty appearance. And in the Canadian toad, there's multiple warts surrounded by kind of these darker splotches. So you, you know, take a look in here and you see, okay, there's like one, two, three, four. There's there's a bunch of warts in all of these darker spots. The American toad is going to have fewer spots, uh, fewer warts per dark spot. So out here in this area, you're going to find them in pot, uh, potholes, ponds, and lakes. And they have this loud monotone monotone trill and it's it's longer than the tree frogs that we encountered last week so here's the long monotone trill of the canadian toad So it's quite the the loud long call. So let's take a look at the um, American toad that looks pretty similar. Um, I think Paul is writing here. Aren't the parotid glands defense mechanisms that secrete toxins if a predator bite them? That sounds right. Um, I'll I'll double check for next week. And I think the parotid I, that, that that does sound right. <laughs> Anti predator glands. Um, so. The American toad is a much more eastern species, especially, you know, in Canada here. But there is an area of overlap between the two species in Manitoba, especially um, in eastern Manitoba. So in these guys, the cranial crest forms kind of like a, a V that kind of en encompasses the eyes and they don't touch is, is the key here. So the, parot uh, the parotid gland down here, and then we got those cranial crests that form this kind of V around the eyes. And if you remember on the Canadian toad, they touched here in the center. We don't have that with the American toad. Again, the body color is quite variable. You can have browns, reds, olives, and they also have that warty appearance, but they have much fewer warts per spot, usually one or two, you know, sometimes a few more, but in general, it's going to be less warts per dark spot. You'll find them in a wide variety of terrestrial habitats, and they have an even longer monotone trill, which sounds pretty identical, but it is um, it can be a fair bit longer, up to 30 seconds in length. So let's hear the American toad. So very long call, very loud call. You can hear those chorus frogs in the background. Okay, let's compare the two side by side here. So we got those cranial crests that touch for the Canadian toad and the cranial crests that form a V kind of, you know, bracing the eye and the cranial crests don't touch for the American toad. You're likely going to be able to tell them apart by, you know, where you're at. So if you're in a more Western location, like say Saskatchewan, you're going to be having Canadian toads. Um, if you're in Eastern Canada, it's going to be American. And I, I honestly don't know if you can tell, you know, the sounds apart because, you know, the the calls are relatively similar and it's and it's kind of the duration so i think you're probably going to be stuck using location for these or just say canadian or american toad if you're not sure but if you happen to see the little critters you can take a look for those cranial crests okay let's review some of the bird sounds that we had so far we've got today the gadwall going bep 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 bep, bep like the yip yips from sesame street <laughs> And the light wheezy zoo 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 call. And for those wondering what the yip yips are, there are aliens on the TV show Sesame Street. So 
those lovely light zoo 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 calls of the widgeon. Great blue heron, loud guttural croaks and squawks. I find I hear this mostly as they're flying overhead. And the Wilson's fowler up going woof, woof, woof. The American bittern is that slew pumper, that pumper lunk. It's an incredible call, and I don't know if I mentioned, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but that that American bittern call, because it's so low and bassy, it travels an incredible distance, especially if there's any water in between. So you can hear them, you know, a kilometer away from where they're calling at times. Versus the light cuckoo-cooing of the least bittern, which you definitely won't hear a kilometer away. Okay, that's it for our regularly scheduled birds and amphibians. But last week we had somebody email me um, about how to tell apart the invasive Phragmites. Um, they sent this really lovely fact sheet from the Nature Conservancy of Canada in Manitoba. And essentially, you know, what it comes down to looking at the, the native subspecies versus the invasive subspecies, a lot of it is going to have to do with looking at teeny tiny little parts. Um, so the ligule of the middle leaf, and if you're not familiar with grass identification, the, the leaf kind of wraps around the stem and then kind of bends off. And at that bend, you can see there's a little bit of a ridge here that continues straight up where the rest of the leaf has bent away. You've got this little, little bit of uh, leafy material sticking straight up and that is called the ligule. And the ligule of the middle leaf, <laughs> excluding the fringe, um, is very thin. So it's not, you know, not very robust. Apparently on the native subspecies, the ligule of the middle leaf um, is rather thick, <laughs> almost a almost a centimeter. So it's it's quite difficult to um, to tell that apart. Um, if you have a hand lens, if you are a botany nerd, I I have a hand lens. I'm not a total botany nerd, but I do find it <laughs> find it comes in handy. Um, you can take a look at the ligule. Um, the stems in the invasive species they stay greener longer than the native Phragmites and are blue-green in color. In fall, the lower stem is yellowish or yellowish-brown, and the leaves persist until late fall. On the native subspecies, it's we're going to be having these lovely kind of reddish stems um, in the fall, kind of this reddish-purple color. So the leaves are green, um, greenish-yellow, and fall off pretty easily in late summer. And in the fall, you're mostly going to be having these naked little stems that are this rusty reddish color. If you take a look at the the individual flower parts, the glooms, and those are these little sheath-like things that kind of encompass the little flower. They're going to be shorter in the, the lower gloom, very lower one, is going to be shorter in the invasive one, usually between 2.6 and 4.2 millimeters long. And in um, the native species, or native subspecies, the gloom is going to be quite a bit longer, so it's going to be 3.8 to 7 millimeters long. And that's that kind of lowest little bract on the flowering structure. So if you get up close and you, you take a look at all those fluffy um, little flowery looking bits, take one of those and you can have the, um, you know, a little gloom look. Or you can just wait around till fall and take a look to see if it does this. Um, so it, it can be quite evident in the fall um, as they turn this reddish purple for the native subspecies. So that might be um, the easier way if you're not inclined to really look up close and measure itty bitty teeny tiny parts of plants. Um, apparently they're, the native subspecies is 
it forms less dense stands, but it, it can still look pretty similar to the invasive one, I think, in the right habitats. And so you're really wanting to get a closer look before you say, oh, no, I've got Phragmites. It must be bad. I'll rip it all out. Just I, I would caution that you be careful, um, especially here on the prairies where we do have um, the native subspecies. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's definitely worth taking a look at. Um, another invasive that is starting to show up a bit more on the prairies is the flowering rush. This is actually quite a beautiful species, um, which is, you know, too bad that it, it takes over stands. Um, so it's got pink flowers and a bit of an umbel, and an umbel is um, a flower structure like this where all of the, you know, stems of the flowers tie into one spot and they kind of make this sort of... Um, flat top shape with all of the little branches of the flowers coming up at around the same level. So the leaves are kind of long and pointed. They could be up to a meter long and triangular in cross section. You'll find them in slow moving still water up to three meters deep. Um, I actually found some of these uh, along the Saskatchewan Alberta border while I was on a, a paddle trip down the South Saskatchewan, um, which was not great news because that meant that was, you know, um, the species creeping into Saskatchewan. It had been found in Alberta further um, upstream, but it hadn't quite made its way into Saskatchewan yet. And so that prompted people from the um, Canadian, uh, the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center to go out and take a look and they found um, a fair bit more. So flowering rush is making its way into the province. So if you find it, um, you know, it's one of those good things to let folks know. And I'll tell you how you can let folks know in a bit here. Um, another invasive species is the purple loosestrife, while very, very beautiful, um, it is one of those things that will take over, you know, especially sedgy areas, it can, it can grow and just outcompete all of the native species and, you know, the native species are what our plants and other plants and animals have adapted to live around, and, you know, some of these species choke out kind of some of them fairly at risk habitats. A lot of our shallower wetlands are the ones that are most at risk from, you know, use, they're easier to drain. Um, so especially when you have a plant that is likely to colonize a lot of these shallower um, spaces, it can really change the ecosystem dynamics. So purple loosestrife is one that you see a fair bit in the east, but there's definitely um, some cases of it out here on the prairies too. It's got this bright purple flower on this lovely little spikelet. And one of the if you're if you're not sure because there's a few native species that that look like it, um, uh, fireweed has a similar look. Take a look at the stem. It's got a square stem with paired leaves, and the leaves have this lovely smooth edge. They're not like super jagged or anything, and they're at right angles from each other to the stem, so they're often you know at a different angle. So they're not going to all be coming out in the same orientation. You'll find them in, you'll find this plant in ditches, wet meadows, marshes, and lake edges. And I know there are some places back east where, you know, what was once a sedge wetland is now just completely covered in purple loose strife and that's the only thing growing there. Um, I'm seeing some, some notes in the chat about um, invasive species, so that's awesome. Um, those are just the three kind of bigger ones that that came to mind here on the prairies. But, you know, if you're not sure and you want to, you know, have someone help you ID it or just want to report some of these rare species, iNaturalist can be a really great um, resource for that. It's free. You can log in and you submit your observations. You upload photos. It gives you suggestions as to what they might be. And then other members of the iNaturalist community help to come to an identification um, of your species. So especially if you're looking at plants, make sure you take nice pictures of the flowers, but don't stop there. Take pictures of the leaves and stem as well, because oftentimes you need those other characteristics. Just one shot of the flower is not going to do it. Um, iNaturalist is a, is a fun place to, to add those things. And a lot of the uh, conservation data centers, a lot of the provincial um, invasive species mapping, um, they're, they're all plugged into iNaturalist. So oftentimes um, your observation will just get added to some of those projects. So I know in Saskatchewan here, um, 
you know, if it's a rare species, it'll automatically get populated, I think, in the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center. If it's an invasive species, you can tag the IMAP Invasives uh, project, which is a project of the, the, the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center to help map invasive species. And as I said, you record observations, share them, and then um, you can have discussions about what you found or, or what the identification might be. So that's where I would recommend you, you know, share your photos of plants if you want to help map where invasive species or native species might be. It's really fun and addictive. It's like collaborative eBird for other taxa. <laughs> Birds too, um, but for the most part, um, I usually put, you know, insects and mammals and plants there. So very cool. Okay, with that, I just want to say thank you all for attending. Um, if you want to reach out to me, you can reach me at skatlas at birdscanada.org. Um, you know, you can visit the Marsh Watch website if you want to review this webinar or other past ones. They're all going to be up there. Um, you can visit birdscanada.org or, you know, hit us up on all of the socials. We are a not-for-profit, so if you feel so inclined to give a donation, we'd always appreciate that. And just a big shout out to our supporters who have made Marsh Watch possible. That's the Manitoba Fish and Wildlife Enhancement Fund, the Government of Canada, Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment's Fish and Wildlife Development Fund, Sask Power, and Wildlife Habitat Canada.